that I have got this opportunity to introduce Professor Babani Shankar Das. He is working as a professor in Agricultural and Food Engineering Department, Indian Institute of Technology, Karakpur. He has done his PhD in the year 1996 in soil physics from Kansas State University, Manhattan, USA. His research interest lies in conducting teaching and outreach activities in the area of soil, hydrology, and environmental quality for sustainable management of agricultural systems. His current research areas are in water and nutrition transport in soil, digital soil mapping, reflectance spectros spectroscopy, multispectral and hyperspectral remote sensing. He is a member of many uh, reputed journals, like a member and an editorial member for uh, a number of reputed journals. He has got a number of publications on his name to his credit, uh, like around 66 international journals, four national journals, 10 book chapters, one book, book written and many training manuals prepared. He had uh, a lot of awards and honors to his credit, uh, one of which is to uh, mention uh, the Fellow of Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Australia in 2016. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. It's uh, glad that uh, we have you here. Uh, so you can go ahead uh, with your presentation on uh, soil data challenges and applications. Thank you very much uh, for having me uh, for this uh, webinar series. Um, and, and it's uh, indeed a pleasure to, to come and, and give this talk. Uh, um, you know, uh, been trying to really look at soils uh, from uh, uh, different angles for almost a couple of decades now. And so, um, you know, it would be good to uh, sort of, you know, uh, talk about this uh, very wonderful topic, uh, these uh, soil data challenges and opportunities. Um, uh, once again, you know, before I start, uh, I have uh, uh, been in, you know, a discussion about different aspects of, uh, you know, soils with, uh, uh, with cropping and, and I have been, uh, you know, seeing a lot of, uh, of, your, uh, of your engagement uh, in the, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, in the agricultural sector and specifically, you know, you are, uh, in the, uh, uh, you know, touching the lives of so many farmers. And, and that's, uh, you know, very, very wonderful thing uh, you, are, you are trying to do. And, um, you know, uh, so therefore, uh, you know, uh, coming here and talking to you, giving this uh, uh, seminar uh, is an opportunity for me and, and it's a privilege to be here. Um, so uh, I know that you already, uh, you know, have uh, our students in your group, but uh, I still thought that I would, uh, you know, tell you where I come from. Uh, uh, as all of you guys know, it's Indian Institute of Technology, the very first IIT system. Uh, it, uh, you know, it is uh, quite, uh, quite uh, old, 1951, and uh, fortunately, in 19, uh, you know, 52 itself. You know, we started the agricultural and food engineering department. We are uh, we have substantially grown uh, over time. Uh, if you look at us, we are currently uh, 19 different departments. And 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 you know what? This slide when I was making, uh, I was updating the number of uh, uh, units that we have. We used to have just nine centers uh, uh, about three four years ago. Uh, we have now uh, 17 centers. We are uh, 12 different schools. We have added two academies. Uh, we have, uh, you know, added a medical school, um, and and um, you know, it's a, it's a uh, it is now uh, of course an institute of eminence. Uh, so uh, very very uh, early on, uh, our uh, our uh, uh, founding members uh, really recognized that this country it has to really run, you know. It has to really look into the technology intervention in, in the agricultural sector. Pretty, you know, pretty early, 1952, they started this uh, ag engineering department. Uh, we are close to uh, 500 students. We are currently about, uh, you know, uh, about 30, 31, uh, you know, faculty members. Uh, we offer uh, the undergraduate programs uh, in, you know, BTEC. Uh, uh, and we take honors. Uh, we also have a dual degree program that is like a five-year program. We uh, have uh, our six uh, different divisions uh, from, you know, farm missionary power to aquacultural engineering. Uh, in, you know, each of these, uh, these divisions, we offer an MTech programs uh, 
in addition to our dual degree program, we of course uh, you know have the PhD in all the uh, different uh, uh, branches in our department. We are close to 100 plus PhD students uh, all the time. Uh, we are uh, uh, you know the department uh, uh, you know uh, tries to uh, work on different aspects of precision farming, uh, food process engineering. Uh, our, uh, you know, this agricultural engineering and food engineering, uh, you know, are quite, uh, you know, well-developed uh, uh, programs. Uh, and, and so in that, uh, you know, there is uh, this small soil science division that I, I come from, and I have been trying to really, uh, you know, uh, plug in uh, and, and uh, trying to work in the, in the areas of soils. So, um, you know, the, the uh, soil data that, that uh, you, uh, you really uh, look at, um, you know, there are, uh, when it comes to soils in particular, what I really uh, see uh, is this uh, five different aspects, if you can cover, then, then pretty much uh, it really covers uh, 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 the entire, uh, entire soils domain. And as you know, you know, soils are pretty much, uh, 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 you know, the hidden half of agricultural sector. Uh, and, and so, you know, the other half is in, in the above ground, the, 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 you know, portion underground of the crop that uh, you are part of cropping, uh, you know. Uh, so pretty much half of it is soils. And when it comes to soils, therefore, when you look at a soil data, you really have, uh, you know, both the kinds of data that you really come across, the static data to, to dynamic data, uh, you also uh, really get to see, um, you, know, uh, you know, some of these uh, data points are, are uh, quite uh, variable in nature. Uh, when you look at properties, for example, they are, they are spatially variable, they are temporally uh, also there, they change with time. Uh, you know, when you look at some of the dynamic uh, quantities, such as, uh, you know, if you want to really look at how much nutrients are there, how much uh, water is there. And so therefore, uh, you know, much of it uh, are also, you know, the change with time in addition to, uh, you know, in, in, in addition to the space. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, lot of these uh, data uh, if you look at, uh, you know, starting from plant nutrients to the physical chemical properties to, you know, engineering properties. Uh, and then, you know, uh, lately we have been talking about the, you know, uh, the properties that are related to the function of a soil. So kind of, you're looking at a, at a uh, sort, of, sort of macroscopic scale. Uh, now, all these data have to be collected. That's the, you know, all of this data have to be sensed, have to be collected, have to be uh, you know, uh, you have to go through this measurement, uh, you know, whether it's an in-situ measurement, uh, you know, right, going to the agricultural field or, you know, going to, uh, you know, for instance, uh, uh, you know, getting the soils to the laboratory, or for that matter, if you really want to be able to measure them from remote sensing platforms like satellites and or, or maybe like drones or, or, or aircrafts and all that. Um, now, once you collect the data, you also need to really sort of, uh, it's not possible to really collect data for every, every location. Therefore, it is important to really uh, be able to map this uh, soil data. So, so sort of interspatial interpolation, geospatial interpolation is also important. And, and in a couple of things that comes in there, whether you really use a remote sensing approach or you use some kind of a uh, kind of a combination of the geostatistics and machine learning uh, in, in the framework of a digital soil mapping, um, you know, uh, and, and, and then, then of course, you know, you could probably interpolate, uh, you know, from one location to the other, but at the same time, it is also, it also becomes important that, okay, you know, as we really interpolate, it's not possible to really deal with the numbers for every pixel that you are really looking at. So therefore, is it possible to really do some kind of a scaling, some kind of a, you know, uh, kind of uh, identifying similar areas in, uh, on, on the field so that you could really, uh, you know, manage these numbers in a, in a practical uh, and, and, and uh, feasible manner. Now, we also look at different kinds of processes. 
you, uh, you know, whether use a mechanistic model or statistical model, you know, you know, all these activities that really we do at the end of the day, of course, you know, our stakeholders, our farmers, therefore some kind of a packaging is necessary so that these information goes to the, to the farmers. Um, and, and if you look at, uh, you know, look at our country, um, the land holding that, that, that we have are uh, sort of growing, uh, you know, currently we are at about 148 million land holdings, uh, roughly 140 million hectares. So almost, you know, one hectare a piece, uh, and it is growing. And if you look, if you correlate that with the population growth, you will see a very linear trend between the population increase and, and, and our increase in the land holding. Now, you know, if you were to really measure all these properties, of course, they are very time consuming. Uh, you know, you need a lot of consumables and, and also there is an, it's an expensive kind of business. And so if you, you look at the technology, now if you really look at the technology, you know, you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, for instance, you know, if you start with a, something like a visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum, something like a you know, 0 0.4, 0 0.35 micron, all the way go to the millimeter like a microwave, you know, none of these part of the electromagnetic spectrum, you know, penetrates too much into the soil. So soil is pretty much opaque to most of the sensing energies, whether it is, you know, uh, in visible part of the, or an IR spectroscopy, you could see that they only go up to one millimeter deep. Or if you look at a clay soil, for instance, uh, you know, hardly a microwave will, will enter uh, about about a centimeter. Now you know these all these technological barriers haven't really stopped us. You know, so if you look at our, you know, you go back to you know, people love soils, people love love agriculture because that's our food. And if you look at you know Vedic times, you know, we were looking into soils, uh, you know, based on their capabilities. We needed classified soils into okay, you know, what is good in terms of what can you grow? You know, something like, you know, you would really have, uh, uh, grow, you know, soils good for sesame. You know, you go to, uh, you know, people knew about sandy soils back in pre-Vedic time, Vedic times. Uh, people knew what kind of clay soils are, what, you know, if you have a, uh, you know, uh, crop for like a jute, you know, clay soils will be good. Yeah, you know, we knew about uh, this in importance of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, uh, water rainfall. We, you know, look at these numbers, you know, we even, I, you know, estimated that 50% of the rain falls into the ocean. You know, the data science that you are kind of looking at, the, the exact data, or, or you want to really look at a categorical variable, you know, people knew that, okay, if it rains in certain part of the time, it, you know, you will see this. And so, so this kind of categorizations were also also there back then. So whether it's a Vedic time or or, or if you look at you know uh, the modern times, you know uh, here is a here is a uh, picture that I share um, you know uh, from Rothamsted uh, in 1925. They they had uh, this uh, tractor uh, connected to uh, like a strength measurement system, like a dynamometer. And, and they were able to do, you know, you know, online on the go recording of this, this soil strength, you know, like a chart and, and, and would really create a map of these, this area. And so mapping was pretty much, uh, if you look at this kind of activities, you know, was pretty, pretty uh, 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 from a long period of time, we have been interested and we have engaged with, uh, with how to really, uh, uh, understand soils and, and agriculture. Uh, look at if you look at the modern times, uh, mapping almost started in you know 18th century, 1820. Uh, you know the first soil maps were prepared like 19, 1882. National soil maps started uh, you know almost 1900. Uh, and, and and if you look at the uh, creation of the soil databases, uh, uh, you know. Uh, almost in 1970s, you would see the catalogs of soils prepared, and and uh, you know at the end of this, uh, uh, the beginning of the 21st century, uh, the soil databases uh, started to be built up. U.S. building one is to 250,000 scales. Uh, you know, 
uh, with the tune of something like 18,000 soil locations across continental, continental United States, uh, you know, having the, uh, the, the national level maps, even the uh, local level one is to 12,000 maps being available. And we have come a long way to really build this uh, world uh, uh, soil information systems. Uh, you know, now almost every country have their uh, national soil databases. And if you look at, uh, you know, uh, by, you know, look at multiple countries like Europe, for instance, you will see that these uh, databases are now uh, large databases. I, if you look at the Lucas database, for example, it's uh, uh, almost uh, 20,000 soils uh, across uh, 34 different countries. And, and look at the grid size, almost like two kilometer by two kilometer grid size. All that data is being, uh, uh, databases being generated. And, and what that these databases have uh, uh, you know, enabled us to really create these beautiful digital soil maps. And these are not merely just a map. Rather, the information, the process, the, the output, the inferences are built into these digital soil maps. That means that you know, if, if you have a soil uh, digital soil map, you will be able to really uh, you know, understand what processes really took place in those locations. And, and so therefore, you know, uh, as the processes change, you should be able to manipulate these digital soil maps in a, in a very meaningful manner. And, and so, uh, it's, so, so it's not just, just interpolation. So, uh, so therefore the ability to predict these, uh, the, the soil behaviors are, are a lot better with these kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, digital soil maps. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the world now, you know, a, a number of countries, for example, have digital soil mapping done. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, from Denmark to, uh, to Sri Lanka, you know, and, and where not, uh, you know, we have been trying to really do digital soil mapping for the, for the Indian soils ourselves. Um, you know, we have uh, all the data that National Bureau of Soil Survey uh, put together, we were, uh, we are in a position to, um, you know, uh, pull at all that data, almost like uh, 1,600 different location. We also looked at different, you know, publications, and so we have created this Indian soil legacy database, where there are 1,700 locations, layered soil data are available, almost like 10,000 layers. So, so, so we have 10,000 different records of multiple soil parameters, and and using that you could create this beautiful digital soil maps, which are kind of linked to uh, the processes that occurs in a, in a soil. So for example, you, know, you look at uh, uh, soil organic carbon, for instance, the beautiful uh, output that has come out of this uh, digital soil mapping is that if you look at all these greenish shades, you know, in the peripheral part of the India, if you look at those versus all these gray shades, you know, all these agroecological regions, you see that the association between soil carbon and clay content is different uh, in the sense that all these greenish shades tend to have higher organic carbon content, uh, you know, uh, associated with the same amount of organic, uh, same amount of clay content, uh, you know, compared to this inner part of the country. And, and of course, you know, if you look, go to north, uh, uh, northeast, or if you go to the northern part of the country, uh, the agricultural or intensive agriculture still have not really kicked in. And so therefore you will see that, you know, organic carbon generally is still high. The mineralization is not still, you know, they are not quite exploited as, uh, you know, as is. And so therefore these beautiful, uh, you know, process level, concept level kinds of things that you can, uh, you know, look, look into. Um, this is the, uh, the, the data set of the, this world uh, soil information system that, that currently that we have, you could see that these red dots almost kind of, you know, covering this entire, entire globe. And you could see that, uh, you know, uh, density of these soil profile locations, for instance, if you are looking at uh, uh, United States, for instance, uh, it's almost like, uh, you know, uh, 600, you know, about, uh, uh, 
around six profiles uh, you know, per thousand square kilometer. Uh, whereas uh, when it comes to the, the Indian subcontinent, uh, I think two studies that have been taken, uh, taken place, uh, one by Dr. Srinivas's group and one uh, by our group, we are still about half a soil profile. That means every 2000 square kilometer, we have one profile data available. So there is a requirement, you know, for us to, uh, you know, uh, increase that, uh, uh, that soil uh, profile density uh, so that our, our predictive maps going to be uh, a bit uh, more, uh, more accurate. Um, you know what? Uh, fortunately, if you look at, uh, you know, as a, I was kind of kind of looking at, okay, how are we doing in terms of digital soil mapping globally? If you look at these publications, you know, five-year publications, we are really exponentially increasing, you know, both globally and also locally. You know, if you look at the digital soil mapping, for instance, uh, or uh, uh, something like in terms of creating the uh, uh, soil databases, or uh, using new technologies like reflectance spectroscopy, you know, we are sort of publishing almost more than, uh, you know, 5,000 papers. Uh, uh, so, so almost like 1,000 papers a year. And, and so, so these, uh, these developments are, are actually very rapidly taking place. Uh, you know, so we, it's, we, we are kind of standing, uh, obviously, in a crossroad in, in this, you know, technology uh, development. Uh, and, and its implementation. Uh, when it comes to, you know, one of the, the sensings, for example, uh, the, the spectral reflectance as a non-invasive uh, method, and as, a, as a method of very rapid measurement has really uh, come a long way. Uh, you know, we are almost, uh, almost uh, down to the point that we are uh, ready to operationalize a lot of these uh, uh, reflectance spectroscopy stuff. Now, the beauty in this is that because the chemical bonds really vibrate in specific frequencies and, and because the different materials, the chemical compositions would change with the different materials and therefore the different materials would really have different spectral signatures, it is possible for us to really you know, identify actually what is the material that you have. So, you know, uh, uh, so, uh, so essentially, what what you can really do, what we can really do is, you know, by looking at these spectral signatures from, uh, you know, starting from uh, something like a visible part to all the way to this mid infrared, you see that you know very specific signatures here, uh, very specific uh, uh, reflectance features, specific absorption features. And, and all of the all of them are kind of influenced by specific components of the soils. And so what is being done is you create a database of the soil spectra and, and kind of create intelligent uh, you know, data processing environment and should be able to therefore infer the uh, properties of the soil. So this is being done quite a bit. And, 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 and you know, in this, what we need is a very large uh, spectral libraries. And we have been in our lab uh, looking at you know creating these uh, spectral databases uh, across different uh, locations at different scales, uh, we have uh, you know bunch of properties at uh, you know bunch of locations. Uh, we almost uh, have you know soil samples from many different parts of the country. Uh, these are uh, all our locations from where you know we have collected samples. We have data even from Leh Ladakh. Uh, we have created uh, we have uh, we have created uh, you know uh, multiple data sets at different scales um, all this uh, data this is coming from uh, like a farmer's field so smallholder farms in uttar pradesh and and so uh, trying to really uh, you know having all of these we have been in a position to create new uh, spectral uh, algorithm for estimating a large number of properties and all these, uh, you know, the green ones that you you see here, uh, you know, they are the, the, the very first time somebody has used this spectroscopy uh, to estimate uh, these kind of properties. And so you see uh, a, a, a kind of wide uh, range of soil properties, you know, whether it is uh, hydraulic properties to the uh, things like, uh, you know, weathering indices or something like an liquid limit or plastic limit. Uh, we even looked at 
ability to estimate the quality of tea, uh, you know, algal pigments in water bodies. Uh, we even looked at uh, how to get soil water potentials. Uh, of course, micro and macronutrients. Uh, we even looked at, you know, if we could really use spectroscopy to, to uh, uh, estimate the quality of the coal. And, and so all of these uh, allowed us to really uh, see whether, uh, you know, allowed us to really conclude that laboratory scale methods are really good in terms of estimating different, you know, properties of the material. Now we, you know, we also have really looked into the possibility of remote sensing, specifically going from this proximal sensing to the hyperspectral uh, remote sensing. And, and, and you know, uh, in 2015, ISRO and NASA got together. They had this uh, Everest flight uh, across different parts of the country. And, and we were uh, on the ground and we were, uh, you, know, create, you know, taking the soil samples from those, these uh, multiple locations in Odisha. And, and if you look at uh, our some sampling locations, we have a variety of, uh, you know, ground condition from, you know, starting from the uh, uh, bare soil to, uh, to harvested rice crop here, or, uh, you know, have uh, like a, you know, pyra crop being, uh, 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 being uh, practiced uh, after the harvest of rice to take advantage of the residual soil moisture. And, and having all of these, we uh, uh, try to do the, uh, again, the, the, uh, this uh, data analytics, uh, we were able to measure quite a uh, you know, few properties uh, from soil texture to nutrient contents, uh, even some of these uh, you know, crop residue parameters. And you know, one of the beautiful thing about it the, is that you will be, once you have these algorithms built, you will be able to convert that entire uh, you know, remote sensing image into a, uh, like a soil map that I, I show you uh, here, like the, uh, for, uh, for clay content, for instance, um, you know. And, and so a, a lot of these capabilities that, that we have, uh, you know, uh, pretty much leads to a, a very simple conclusion that perhaps we can really engage with these technologies of digital soil mapping, uh, technologies of uh, you know reflectance spectroscopy. Uh, but you know what? Uh, Any time that you really look at this technology, the question uh, uh, of okay, uh, 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 you know uh, how good is the technology? You know how can we really uh, engage with the technology? How can we really you know make it packaged so that people can really uh, uh, use it? Um, you know, even even you know things like we are we will be uh, uh, in, we will be uh, have to look into okay you know how affordable is the uh, technologies you know so so here is uh, uh, some of the validation R squares from my laboratory that I have really uh, put put a histogram to it so so you know what if you look at the uh, the the statistics for example you know statistics are not good you know sixty percent. R square many times we will not be able to convince anybody, you know. Um, so, so, uh, but, but you also need to, you know, whenever you are looking at the, the R square, you, we, we also really look at, we need to really look at the errors. We would, we need to really look at the confidence intervals and all that. Not only that, we also need to look at, you know, uh, you know, agri in agricultural sector in particular, we are not, um, you know, very particular about, uh, uh, you know, the, you know, exact numbers. We are actually interested in 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 terms of uh, you know rec making recommendations. And so, when you are making a recommendation, that means you are kind of recommending in the in a in a sort of a range, for instance. And so, what we we had a, a very uh, uh, nice example. Uh, nice example. We were working with the soils of uh, Papua New Guinea in cocoa farms. And so what we did, we you know the, we were asked to do the soil testing for them for them and, and build the uh, uh, the spectral algorithms so that uh, we can rapidly do the soil assessment. And we did all that, but then we went a, a step further. What we did is we we looked at the production model, you know, uh, a soil diagnostics, and we kind of entered our wet chemistry based measurements, and also the measurements that came out of our spectroscope, okay, and created a, a recommendation, nutrient recommendation 
and uh, you know this uh, uh, this uh, uh, two graphs that you see they are pretty much uh, uh, you know they, they tell us uh, they tell us the uh, this is our wet wet chemistry this is our spectroscopy we had four different sites in papua new guinea in copper farms uh, and and you know some of the, the one of the sites our recommendation was you know we we need we didn't we need to really, we needed to only do a standard recommendation and if you look at both the graphs you know they are almost identical so what you see here is that is is that you know because see you are not going to really apply a fertilizer based on okay exactly how many kilograms the crop will remove rather you are going to say that okay if my my nitrogen content in, is in a low medium high accordingly you will create a recommendation so therefore you know when you when it comes to spectroscopy therefore you should be in, you know in a position to really apply these technologies as is so where is the problem problem is the cost and you know if you if you look at about 10 years ago a, a mobile handset that you were holding and a mobile handset you are holding now you know in there is the, the cost has really you know gone it, it has it has gone to oblivion almost you know almost everybody is able to afford a phone now even you know for that matter like a smartphone uh, uh, and so therefore technology uh, and the cost they really follow kind of different things that we need to really have to really engage with Uh, so that's one of the example the second example was that we, you know we we thought that okay you know can you really do uh, uh, can you can you really do high resolution um, uh, soil mapping uh, and so well, you know we we looked at a, a completely water set and and we wanted to see whether these small scale point measurements of soil data that you collect you know maybe say 100 grams of soil you take can you really make hydrologic decisions and so we went to a water set we had about 100 soil samples collected and uh, we created something called this pseudo transfer functions and these are essentially you know you have a you have a difficult to measure property and and you you know it takes time takes more money but you can really express all of them in terms of some kind of a very easy to measure properties like you know if you have a hydraulic conductivity for instance you look at like silt content or sand content or soil ph and 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 so therefore thereby you can very quickly multiply to multiple locations so essentially you could really take a soil texture map and and convert it into water holding capacity for instance that's that kind of a capability that we were looking at and so we had this data we did this regression digging geo special mapping and and we really created we engaged with the you know like uh, supervised uh, uh, you know uh, classification we looked at you know for the membership uh, functions we really uh, you know created uh, uh, you know uh, quite uh, we would engage we engaged with data analytics actually and then created uh, these new uh, new maps new maps in the sense that okay these are the these are the properties that we are going to use with the entire water set can be really simply divided into just 17 you know sub basins and and you delineate all those stream work and then come up with say okay you know run it in you know put that data into uh, like a hydrologic model and create this outputs in of flow uh, runoff for example and and you could see that uh, you know uh, and these are actually experimental data this is our new approach where where we are engaged with you know data analytics geospatial mapping and this is this classical uh, kind of these soil survey maps and you could see that in many instances we were actually close to uh, you know what we were observe, observing you know so so here is a here is an, another example that if you really have intensive measurements you would be able to scale it up to water set scales and beyond that uh, my third example is the most interesting one to me and and this is you know if you look at the this eastern part of the country lots of rice is grown you know and and you will see uh, and and you will see that uh, you know uh, the when you look at the water requirement across the globe in rice fields and i want you to really look at this this the lower range you, you see 
millimeter of rainfall is more than what we get as an average for the country, right? And, and imagine this, if you are going to use all that water in growing one crop of, uh, of rice, and, and that's it, you know, there is no water left out to do any other thing. So, uh, uh, and so therefore, uh, it's, it's very, very interesting for us to really want, we would really wanted to really engage and see whether can we do, uh, you know, look at these from a soil's perspective, do a lot of studies and can we really come up with a way to really reduce this water requirement? Um, you know, our first thing was observe, making observation, creating data, right? So your first step is to really make observations. You look at the rice fields all over, there are cracks. Of course, water is going to flow down through those cracks. If you look at the rice fields, there's in many rice fields, you will see these earthworm holes, you know, earthworms will build castles. Um, look at this one. You know, this is like uh, in the month of May or June, like late April or May, look at these rice fields, dry everywhere. Look at this gentleman who is, uh, you know, very happily hibernating at a depth of about 48 inches. And look at these guys. These are the Mr. Roots, right? And uh, they are happily going to that depth, right? Here is another observation. Look at this. You know, this was a chance. I had this experiment. I had this big pipe, okay? And the pipe had a had a hole somewhere, and there was a bottle, right? And look at this. You could really easily walk on the these dikes around the rice field. Okay, and water pretty much come underground and happily get bottled up here, right? It makes, makes you think that, okay, you know, you are kind of looking at the soil from an outside and making a conclusion about this soil is that, soil is that, you know, but a lot of thing actually happening through the, through the, you know, under, you know, below the soil, right? And you could see that water pretty much bottled here comes down to this place. There is some kind of an internal network, right? We did a lot of measurement. I was kind of young that time, and, and I was able to do a lot of measurement myself. Not everybody was happy, you could see, but uh, some of them were happy and some of them were still collecting samples, and that's what a typical soil science is all about. You know, not always computer. Um, and that was me, and I, you know, IIT Kharagpur was building a house, and there was a big trench in our rice field from one side to the other side, you know, so I said, okay, you know, here is an opportunity for me. I should be able to look at an entire cross section of the rice field and able to really see what is going on to the to the flow processes. And and you know what? So I went to every one of those points and collected a sample. And I really measured the density of the soil, measured the porosity of the soil, and 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 created a map of you know density. So basically, wherever the bulk density is high, that is the porosity is low. That means that is a very compacted area. So, so this point is actually the, the, the dike, so bund. And so one side of the bund to the other side of the bund, something like a 25 meter, right? And this is this, you know, cross section up to a depth of 1.2 meter. And what you see is that when we grow rice in, and do the puddling, the transplanting thing that happens, you really create a kind of a compacted layer below that that plow, you know, and, uh, but then what happens is, you know, there are lots of bypass that takes place, you know, because in, these are not really very compact. And, and so, you know, maybe there is a crab making a hole or, or, or something, you know, my, maybe earthworms are there. So my, you know, my question was that, okay, can I really make it, make something that, okay, everywhere become compact. And that's what I, I did. I really removed the bun. And then ask one of my guys to, really, you know, compare that burn completely and look at this result. Two years of studies, you know, several replications. Look at this. This is without burn plugging. This is with burn plugging. Look at this. I am pretty much, you know, I am pretty much much decreasing the water requirement by half. So here is an example that really, again, you know, you engage with technology, you know, your water use efficiency going to be doubled, you know. So when we talk about, can we really double the, the, the farm income? 
I don't think we are very far from that truth. Okay, uh, we also really wanted to look at you know okay this is all you know nice bottled rice field. What if you know can we really engage with the dry conditions, right? And so you know I I said okay if the rice does not need does you know this fundamental question that I ask does rice really require a lot of water? You know and I didn't really think that that is true. So I intentionally you know, went to the field and then said, I would dry that soil completely. And then look at what kind of drying that I was doing. You know, we talk about this, this, uh, this uh, drought taking place. And, and so I was kind of, I wanted to really take advantage of that. You know, we have to really convert the adversity into opportunities. That's the bottom line. And so I was kind of, you know, using tensiometers or kinds of sensors as this guy using the spectrodiameter to take the measurements. And, and guess what, uh, you know, what we really, you know, ended up seeing is that wherever we really created water stress, the yield started increasing. And that was true if the stress was during the vegetative growth stage, not in the flowering stage, because flowering stage, the plants will not be able to handle any stress. The fellow is not young anymore. This fellow is already old like me. Uh, these guys are young and they can really handle stress. They can really be exploitative. And you know what? Look at we looked at the roots. The roots were, you know, roots were quite a bit. And you know what? Some of the root lengths were to the tune of 66 centimeters. So I was kind of thinking that how is that there is a compact soil? How is the root is going to grow all the way to 66 centimeters? I was I was really baffled. Guess what we did? We really went to the field. We said, look, that entire area, we will dig it out and uh, we would start really washing them. You know, So from here goes to here, make it upside down, put, put putting water. You can see that there is no root at 15 centimeter depth. And look, there is, I'm cleaning it up. Here is, here is Mr. Root showing up. Slowly, you could see this. Now look at this, guys. Well, you see that these two, plants and their roots, look at that. They're all, and let me put it in water. Look at that. This is what a great partnership they really make, isn't it? Well, you know, what, did, what do you think? What the plant going to do? You really dried the plant. You know, below 15 centimeter, there is a compact layer. The root cannot go in there. So what it is going to do? make friendship among themselves, right? You know, they will not let a single drop of water to go anywhere. They will make a beautiful, you know, beautiful mat and would trap everything that really comes in here. You know, so, so exploring these beyond this human endeavor to really look at yield uh, advantages are, are wonderful opportunities that really waits for us. All right, so therefore, I could really come to my conclusion slides. Um, we really are in a crossroad. Uh, I, I would tell you the opportunities from diffuse deflectance spectroscopies to portable XRFs, UVs, microwave technologies, LEDs, microfluidics, sensors on the chip, and you can go on and on on the sensors. Well, you know, gone are the days probably where a person is going to go and, and you know, take 10 grams of soil in and put it in a beaker and shake it for five minutes. And you know what, if you really do that job for five minutes, shaking a pea for just making a pH measurement, it exactly takes 5,280 working days to just do shaking of 148 million soils. Wow, that's a lot of money, my friend. And so now we have better things to do. We have robots, drones, aircraft, satellite platforms, um, number games. You know, you guys are much ahead of me. Uh, Chandra would tell you that too. I have seen him. Uh, machine learning, deep learning, transfer learning, feature selection, artificial intelligence, hard not global soil data, digital soil map, inference systems. We have a bunch of things in our kitty. I would kind of really close with this slide of mine, where uh, I think that I think that this creating digital agriculture in a business that you are in 
uh, I, I think it's, it's good. It's good for the country. It's good for the people. Particularly, it is good for the developing countries uh, because there's a lot of, lot of opportunities for us. Uh, there is partnership needed for sure, like the two rice plants that you see making that partnership. I really insist and urge that the scientific community and the industry must come together. Come together in a very practical way. You know, it just, it's no game. It's just, it needs, you need to, you're kind of dealing with a very live system. You know, plants go out, they are collaborate and there is no reason why we would not. Um, so these opportunities that we have using models and data analytics to interpret data, um, create not only, you know, uh, digital soil uh, or digital crop, dis you know, create digital water. Uh, only then, you know, uh, if you really merge it with digital market, you know, a digital agriculture would be a reality. Um, and, and, you know, we are definitely, as I said, we are at a crossroad and um, information technology is rapidly moving, uh, it proves you are yourself. And so, uh, uh, so you know, there is a, there is a, there is a great confluence that I could, I see about science and engineering and, and management. Uh, I could stop it here and and and, and you know take any questions uh, from you. Um, if if I could answer some of them, I will try my best. Thanks, sir, for uh, giving this wonderful presentation. So it was again. Uh, it was inspiring presentation from you. The work, I think, the, the partnership. It's it's an all the new topic for us. Like I don't know, like whether the two plants interact to pitch them water uh, to grow. So that was interesting. But uh, so uh, uh, to work on this one, sir, uh, I have few questions noted down. So uh, uh, what is the scope of sentinels and then microwave remote sensing? Sorry, the multispectral remote sensing. Uh, in soil mapping and characteristic studies? Uh... We, we just published our uh, Sentinel paper recently, just a couple of uh, weeks ago. Uh, we, uh, we had uh, soil texture predict, uh, uh, um, soil texture as the target uh, uh, soil property. And um, what we ended up seeing, you know, that uh, just not any sentinel image will do the job. So we were looking at um, four years of sentinel data and we had uh, close to 60 plus acquisition dates. But, but again, you know what, that is where we were, uh, we, we, we talk, we, because when we looked at an individual uh, sentinel image, the outputs were not very good. I'll tell you after. But, so, but then we looked at, uh, okay, uh, Let's really look at the conditions under which uh, a particular image is giving a better performance, and, you know, uh, irrespective of what model that you use. And and uh, uh, we uh, uh, we noticed that if you really do a sort of a combination of all those best acquisition dates, put it together, our uh, uh, if I remember correctly our validation R squares are well above 0.6. You know, and that's that's how much you get from a laboratory spectra, for instance, you know, and, and here you are having 10 bands. Uh, I would say that again, you know, that is an untapped uh, opportunity. And, and, you know, gone are the days where, you know, you will really wait for a remote sensing data to show up to your, on your desk. Like this is five day, right? And so, so you have, good window to target um, the, the bare soil condition, okay? Mm -hmm. See, uh, hyperspectral data that I was sharing with you, my model performance was going down for all those places where you have those weeds growing. Mm -hmm. And I mean, something like what? Rice uh, crop, if you take, Harvested uh, rice crop stubbles are going to be almost 80% of the cover. Only 20%, they were kind of completely destroying my model. 
right okay. so therefore therefore identifying those windows where there is no crop residue there is it's bare soil so that means you have already done a plowing uh, and you know soil ba only bare soil condition dry condition it's the moisture that's the problem right and you and you and me all both understand that the soil moisture yeah. right but again you know that's where that's where what we need to do we need to really again become two rice plants we should really now mix technologies right we should really look at a look at a maybe sentinel uh, you know one and then look at a microwave right and get a soil moisture remove the effects of the soil okay and and i'm maybe doing a lot of wishful thinking but but well that's how it really has technologies are built right exactly sir uh, i agree with you uh, but uh, identifying that window uh, there are a lot of potential uh, problems in that so as you said sir uh, maybe the harvesting when we saw the ndv is dipping down maybe as you said the residues might be there on the ground and when we do some analysis we'll be getting all the information from the residues not from the soil and also when we know uh, when we take from the fallow a uh, time as you said like there will be some weed uh, automatically come out in the agriculture fields and before sowing when we see like there will be other impacts like uh, the type of tillage they they do a type of plowing they do so i think that would also have a, a larger impact uh, in analyzing it so yeah uh, i agree i agree uh, yeah. all of that i agree but then again you know what so so where is our see you, you, you see what is the best thing to do best mm -hmm. thing to do is raise hand and say give up nothing will be no see that's 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 best thing to do but here is a here is a way forward so we know that we are making big strides on uh, on riders right so we should think about each problem and and sort of target the, the, the you know it's the the right tool for the right problem each each problem should have its right tool right i think unevenness of the soil okay should be taken care of by the riders right and a worked out like a plowed land should be with less moisture that is an advantage for you know multi spectral or you know spectroscopic approach right mm -hmm. and so i think that best part of each of those technologies have to be merged i mean the, and like i said you know the, the first one is a trivial solution that i was giving you a useless solution you know uh, i think that we should really move towards useful solutions right exactly sir got it and and uh, like there are a lot of free sources available in in the soil domain and the people are using it for multiple uh, simulation models and uh, uh, statistical models to uh, uh, like calculate different things let's say biochemical properties or let's say yield or, or let's say uh, nitrification carbon footprints and all like uh, as we know like uh, all all of this data does not have a density and uh, uh, it is having its own problem so uh, what is happening in this entire ecosystem is like we know the weather we are getting in a, a better way and remote sensing monitoring we are getting in a better way and uh, like what is not missing in this particular uh, uh, ecosystem is the soil precise soil information uh, to know about any any parameter what is underneath so i think uh, uh, w what is your experiences sir uh, on this uh, problem like how to mitigate those or any proxies to it uh, to contribute like to complement the soil i i think what you are, you are that's a bull eye question that you have <laughs> you have you have put at me uh, the you see the up front i'm going to tell you the approach that i am taking mm -hmm. in my own research program will not work okay you see let us let us you see there were several years ago there was uh, there was this uh, uh, this kind of a 
uh, very wise saying that we have to really go after technology, you know. You see, if you look at a petroleum industry, right, they have been able to modify their deal rig so that it is going to, you know, once you really see that there is a possible petrol reserve, it's going to really now bend. It's instead of going straight, it's going to bend, right? If you look at simple ultrasound, right? Technology, right? We have gone a long way. So similar thing that have to be there for this soils too, if we really want to reduce the cost, you know, and, and, and I have done all these calculations about how much time it takes for collecting soil and getting analysis. It is not my friend 200 rupees per sample. It does not work, okay? So what would be the, so we should learn it from other sectors. So one example that comes to my mind, you know, I'm, I'm kind of loudly thinking is that if you look at this, uh, our, uh, our global positioning system, mm -hmm. you know, in global positioning system, system, how have we really done it? There is also signal is very low, right? How have we done it? Now we have master ground stations, right? So see in India also, if you look at our benchmark soils, 1981, 1982, we really put, put, put out those 65 some odd uh, benchmark soils, right? So by now, we should have our benchmark soil situation should have been established, mm -hmm. right? So, so therefore, now, you know, again, I am, I, I, I am going to repeat this. How much time and how much money will it take for us to really establish a thousand benchmark locations in our country. And, and you know, use that as your proprietary benchmark location. Mm -hmm. You okay. see, when, when you look at uh, global positioning system in the world, everybody was depending on US centers, right? US ground stations. Now everybody else is having their own. So likewise, once imagine that IIT Kharagpur decides that, okay, the IIT Kharagpur will have their own ground stations. Tomorrow, somebody else will have it. So it would very quickly multiply. Mm -hmm. So little bit of, I think, I think, you know what, little bit of thinking ahead of our time is necessary. Okay. And uh, if you look at, uh, you know, what is, but, but, but you know what, you know, Dr. Arvind, I would, I would tell you what is so interesting that if you look at Professor Keynes, you know, that uh, automated soil mapping system published in 1925, right? Mm -hmm. That was published in Rotham State. Uh, Rotham State is a very re reputed organization. Keen and Hens were very famous they really put together that soil strength analysis system in 1925. I will tell you, yesterday I checked, there are only 14 citations to that paper. Oh, okay. Okay. So there is, you know, I, I don't know. I, I know there is some kind of, there is some kind of a, there is some kind of a disconnect and we have to reconnect. And again, like I said, all adversities, have to be converted to opportunities, right? That's that's ground rule. So if there is a disconnect, there is an opportunity to reconnect, right? That's correct. Yeah. Yes, sir. I agree. Again, yes. Thanks. Thanks for your clarification, sir. La last question. So recently, I think uh, 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 NIC has opened up uh, the so soil cards. Uh, I think Vibo might be knowing it. So, uh, soil cast data has been made publicly available uh, for every village, uh, what, wherever it has happened. And the recent information, like last year data set also, it is available. And from 2000, uh, I'm not sure, 2010 onwards, some time series data is available. So, uh, sir, uh, I think you might be already having such kind of data sets already. So, uh, 
uh, what, what is what is the authentic uh, authenticity of the data because like we uh, we have seen that, that like the latitude longitude going to 10 15 decimals so uh, and sometimes uh, like it is in the uh, like few points it is in the roads and other stuff so uh, uh, how how like can we can we use that potentially use that to develop uh, some kind of uh, base maps and on top of it use some algorithms to uh, uh, map a, like soil map for india you you know what this is a perpetual problem okay, okay? so therefore what we have done now uh, the spectroscopic community a uh, few years ago i think 2015 or 16 there was a there is a paper where uh, we have uh, written down that these are going to be the rules okay if you are collecting spectra you have to collect 30 spectra and spit out average so you know this uh, internal standardization you know it's a very important thing okay and it becomes very important for the calibration data set Mm -hmm. Right. Otherwise, it is going to be garbage in and garbage out. Right. Okay. And so, so I think that that's that's exactly where well, that see that is why I am kind of advocating quite a bit in different forums wherever I get a chance that whether it is industry or government or an academic institution, let us join our hands together, create this, create this calibration data set. And you know what, sharing would help to reduce the cost. I know that it is expensive, right? You know, so 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 therefore, it, if this happens, then you will have a standardized laboratory, right? So this, you know, this this and, and but then but then again, you know, one thing is that there is a compulsion to really quickly do soil measurement, right? Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is we need to really divide these jobs. These are two different jobs, actually. You know, one is that what the farmers are going to do tomorrow. That's one job. That's a different job. Now, what you and me will do to create a product for the farmers, you know, down the road in five years, that is a different job. And so we as stakeholders, owners of the stakeholding, you know, we need to take that decision. That okay, how, what is that? What is that we are investing? You know, on that output that we are going to deliver five years down the road. Yes, sir. Right. I mean, yeah. but you know, there is as as very 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 kind of a, a non-political. Uh, you know, the thought that comes to me, crosses me, actually, if you look at this nuclear submarine that Australia wants to have, you know, they will be able to deploy in 2040. Right? And so, so, so I think it comes to us, we should also be thinking, so longer time. It's longer we can kind of, yeah, it's not it. Thanks. Uh, uh, just on similar lines, like you were saying about the partnership. So coincidentally, yesterday, uh, I was attending one webinar by uh, Budhiman Manasni on uh, this uh, infrared spectroscopy for mapping soil properties. So that was part of a, like, uh, uh, Glossolan has been created, right? Like Global Soil Laboratory Network by FAO. So that is uh, like, one direction like where they're specifying all the standard ways how to test soil, how to make the spectra available. And I suppose one another, like I also asked one question and they were mentioning, it was the whole that Sydney group, uh, that like whether there are lots of spectral libraries available for different countries. Like they said, uh, globally, it will take time, some years, but for Euro Europe and uh, USA, it's more or less uh, available. So how do you think maybe uh, these uh, spectral libraries uh, can be used like to map more, much better soil properties with time, probably? Yeah, you know what, that's something that I also many times think that, you know, it's 
Um, here's an example. See, many a times when something is not detectable in laboratory, mm -hmm. as an analytical chemist, what we do? We would really put a surrogate standard. We will spike it, right? And we will be able to compare everything, scale everything with regard to our surrogate standard, right? This is done even if you look at an ICP, for example, you want to do arsenic, you know, they will have a soil from Montana as a internal standard, okay. right? So I think in data analytics, if we really approach that, right? So we, we, have, a, we have a sort of a global spectral library, mm -hmm. right? And if we have these, our local soil data, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and basically what, you, what we do is, uh, you know, we recalibrate the model, okay? So you have a, you, you have a diversity, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, so there are two examples that I will give. In our partial least square regression model, Mm -hmm. from our lab, uh, one of the seniors of uh, uh, Chandra, okay. okay, put together this just-in-time modeling. It's called the local modeling, you know. So what he would do is basically goes, he would go to this larger data set mm -hmm. and identify those local data sets that are more relevant, okay? And so we have this model called PLSR, locally weighted PLSR. Okay, and it, you know, when I was using this model recently on the Uttar Pradesh data set, which is coming from seven different districts. Okay, um, you know, I was fortunate to have my hand on the soil and I was kind of doing that. And, uh, and I was, I, it was amazing for me to see that the local model and the feature selection model they were the two models which, which were outperforming all other random forests, support vector machines. Uh, you know, all of them were uh, inferior to uh, this local model and, and, and feature selection. And again, feature selection is also kind of a local in the sense that it is kind of district, you know, connect, also connecting to the feature. So this is one example. There was another beautiful study that has come out of our group where we have taken this cation exchange capacity as a estimate yeah, as, a, as a target variable. And we looked at the entire cation exchange capacity data set of India, right? And so what we try to do is we had our local data set, which we really created, you know? And, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and so, so this local data set, we were using our, as our target. Mm -hmm. Now, background was the National Bureau data set. That is not our data set. Mm -hmm. And so we really try to do this local engagement, okay? And so we'll mix our local data set with mm -hmm. this global, the so-called national data set, mm -hmm. right? And, and sort of take advantage of the diversity of the legacy data, mm -hmm. which is global in nature, and take advantage of the site-specific nature of our local data and build a beautiful model. Okay. Yeah. Which we just we had we also have published this in our uh, in a scientific report, uh, you know this year, and I think you know so therefore the, there are you know what I'm trying to tell you is that there are it is evidential that it would be possible uh, possible for us to do this augmenting. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an augmenting, right? Yeah. Okay. But we have to do it yeah. for sure. Yeah, it's it's like similar to like uh, even he was uh, I mean yesterday he was also talking about that multivariate calibration like using the spectra for getting the local values. So this is Jitendra here. Uh, yes. Uh, hello. I had one question. Uh, uh, especially for this, uh, the, the problem which normally comes every year in Punjab and Haryana. So like when we burn the residues, 
So uh, how did the you know the property of the soil changes and are there any methods or you know like the right materials or nutritions to basically you know like identify the property of the soil which basically indicates that the soil like the residue has been burned here. No, that is I see. You see this, um, you know. I would kind of, kind of, uh, be be uh, be a bit restrictive about it myself because I have not really studied those soils myself. But my first impression is that when you are kind of burning residues, it's, 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 it's not. It shouldn't be allowed not in a country where you have average organic carbon content is only 0.4, okay? Because what we are kind of getting into it is that it's the organic, you, you see, it's the organic carbon and water. These are the two major inputs, right? Now, if you really want to destroy one, that's not good, number one. Number two is that so much of so much of heat, you know, would definitely destroy that carbon, because you know, you know, one of the method of estimation of carbon is loss of ignition, loss of ignition, you know, by loss by ignition method, you know. So essentially, what we do is we take a soil, put it in a muffle furnace, and I am sure what we are doing, we are kind of creating a muffle furnace outside, right? And so that's not that's not something something we should uh, we should uh, we should take definitely corrective measures definitely and 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 you know what but at the same time you know that such a sensitive issue because farmers interests are involved now farmers do not have probably options you know so options have to be created before we tell them that, no, you cannot do it. Yeah. Uh, sir, actually, uh, here, uh, uh, one point, like, uh, I, I read a lot about this residue burning, what is happening in uh, Haryana, UP. What, what was the misconception about the farmers? Like, why they are doing this is because of two things. One you, say, one you said is, like, they don't have any option to uh, move it around. So like they're just burning it and and next one is they they have a, a, a thought that okay uh, whatever residue it's there so when i burn it the ashes will become like a nutrition to it but uh, uh, sometimes like it's not the true uh, it, it burns all the micronutrients and then worms which is present in it so i think maybe uh, there are few companies are, are uh, came friend to collect the uh, residues but still I think they are not uh, in the in the way of transferring it, and then they are doing the burning and then moving forward. You know what? Uh, see, see there are there are, and, and you know what? We are kind of discussing a point where probably it's not, you know, uh, in, in in my scope of be able to really comment on it. So the. Issue is that issue is that as you rightly pointed out that uh, you know uh, scientific investigations leading to shorter term and longer term consequences, right, is a very uh, very important issue. Someone, somebody, uh, somewhere, you know, has to really look at look into that, you know, and. Um, Nutrient addition because uh, uh, because of uh, element elemental component of it. No, no, elemental component of course is does not get burnt out. That's that's for, that's that's understand, understandable. But it's not the you know what it is not the elemental composition that really helps agriculture. If if that was there, you know our. Uh, Mineral composition of soil is good enough. If you look at our mineral composition of soil, it's an elemental composition, right? So it's the it is basically the capability of a soil to support that structure and the capability to 
you know, supply the nutrients in the available form to the plants is important. You know, an example, a simple example is that many times you will see that the phosphate is very high in soil, but you apply fertilizer phosphate, you will still see crop response. So having something does not, you know, guarantee that you are going to, going to be able to use it, you know. I might be having a lot of money, but imagine if I'm a very miser fellow, I won't give you a rupee. Nah? A very simple wisdom that we have. So, so no, I think that the problem is somewhere else. Problem needs to be, you see, it's, it, it needs to be resolved. Exactly. I'm not sure if that is the right answer to the question that you have posed me, but I don't have a better one. It's a, it's a larger question for a larger group, uh, I think it's a, uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, one question um, I had, um, Prof. Sudhas, is, the, um, <clears throat> is actually regarding your field experiments with uh, rice. It's very interesting. Uh, is uh, I think I quickly uh, caught also the names of a few of them, but is this like you know the uh, the length of the root system that you mentioned? Uh, is that like uh, also? Uh, I believe it could there could be variability on the variety of rice grown as well. Like um, how how much does like you know uh, that change? Like how, I mean, have you noticed any variations like? in the length of the root system itself across the different varieties that are available in the region, like under, under stress conditions. Like, yeah. the, you, know, you know, some of the, some of the published reports uh, support our observation that under stress, plants would try to sort of, you know, uh, sort of its exploratory nature, you know, uh, would try to uh, make this, uh, long, you know, cell divisions faster somehow okay and so the roots are roots elongation becomes a become uh, uh, is an observation in many studies that we have seen in at least the water stress studies now varieties of course will have different capabilities um, so it's not only not only because obviously it's a genetic it's a genetic uh, uh, you know trait of a, of a uh, crop uh, and so therefore, uh, uh, environment does influence it, but definitely their genetic capabilities finally would kick in. You know, it would not, it would not really infinitely uh, exploit, be explo exploitative in nature, for sure. Right, right. And when you were talking about this, uh, you know, this exchange and this uh, sharing that was happening across the roots, I was reminded of this book, uh, which I have. Uh, it's called The Hidden Life of Trees. I don't know if you had a, a chance of, to come across that. That's a, also a very beautiful book. Uh, this actually like uh, talks about kind of like uh, also the, uh, you know, the root oh. system, how they uh, intercommunicate with each other and, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and it's a yeah. very beautiful book as well. Like, uh, and I was yeah. reminded of that, like the, uh, the exploration. No, I don't have it. I should get it. You know, some of yeah. these, uh, um, because there are there were another study which was done in Canada, you know, where yeah. they actually, they actually uh, put radioactive pressure to one of the plants. Mm -hmm. And, and you know what, uh, what happened in the process, these plant roots started communicating with the, each other. And uh, the, uh, the plant which was not having radioactivity, you know, it was trying to really help the other plant. You know, yeah, so yeah. so it's it's a wonderful world for sure for biologists. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it's definitely it's very wonderful world, and we have not explored it quite. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's it's very interesting because it seems like you have uh, come to the uh, same conclusion independently, uh, and which is wonderful to see also as this author, you know, Peter, uh, and uh, he also as his observation in a specific region had been that uh, there are other uh, trees which are also their root system support uh, even though there was like loss of uh, the canopy uh, in the, the neighboring trees and somehow they 
he found that the neighboring trees also is like kind of uh, the bark is still uh, still green and he was wondering how that might be possible and he realized that the nutrition is actually coming from the neighboring uh, plant you know so neighboring tree so uh, you know it seems like this symbiotic relationship is uh, i was surprised actually to see this in paddy but uh, it's very beautiful to see yeah thanks yeah. thanks for sharing yeah yeah you know what i was when i was uh, see one of my student was doing this root analysis and you know what you know one day i was the super you know i i was checking his her roots that she was uh, washing and uh, you know she had for every plant you know roots of the plant and there was one more uh, uh, you know uh, like a uh, uh, ball of uh, uh, roots Network, yeah. so i uh, asked her why you are not really taking this samples collect you know properly because part of the roots are are uh, are actually disconnected you know you are breaking it so you are kind of damaging it so she said no you know i have done 400 roots like this every plant root had an additional now you know what you know so so after we have done this this uh, uh, sampling we realize that you know when we are cutting it so there are two roots right so we are cutting it in the middle so you know this half of this this plant here is with this root okay mm -hmm. so when you clearly clean it you have the root of this plant and this much of the root of the neighboring plant mm -hmm. yeah and so that is how i came across about why it is like this oh, okay okay nice okay. yeah wonderful yeah and i have a wonderful video for that you know i was i was taking this and i was it's very exciting to see that this happens to people to plants okay nice nice um uh, i think like you know uh, we have almost uh, reached to the end of uh, today's session as well this was really wonderful um and i think we can probably have more questions as well but we'll be happy to share that through email uh and uh, you know and also uh, you know keep this engagement uh, going on um adilakshmi uh, would you like to uh, say a few words before we conclude and yes pravin sure sure uh thank you so much professor uh, it was uh, really awesome to have your uh, talk here on soil data and its challenges and opportunities further we got to know a lot of things and uh, we can know the uh, passion and rigor and your work all shows in the uh, session here thank you so much professor thank you so much thank you for uh, inviting me so wonderful yeah thank you and we uh, through vibov and others you know we will keep this uh, collaboration and discussion alive and we'll keep going and thank you so much once again for joining us and sharing your research like really appreciate it very well thank you thank you, you so have much. a very good rest of the evening thanks everyone else for joining okay